I try my best to dispel this widespread perception that economics is too complicated for non-economists. And actually, it's very strange because people have very strong opinions about everything. Iraq war, gay marriage, does God exist, you know, global warming. You all have very strong views on these things, despite not having a degree in theology, not having a degree in energy economics, not having a degree in international relations. But when it comes to economics, people say, oh, yeah, it's for specialists, you know, I don't know. But why? I mean, if you can have a very strong view on Iraq or Afghanistan without a degree in international relations, you should have a strong view on government economic policy without a degree in economics. You know, I say that this is only because uh, the economists have been fantastically successful in making people believe that it is actually a lot more difficult than what it really is. So they'll tell you, oh, you know, I could explain it to you, but then you don't understand. Yeah? <laughs> 95% of economics is common sense. Of course, made to look difficult with the use of jargon and mathematics. Huh? <laughs> and even the remaining 5% can be understood at least uh, in its essence, if not in all technical details, uh, if uh, someone bothers to explain it to you in an accessible way. For example, what is economics? You know? The ethical foundations of economics. Whether you can separate economics and politics. And how different ways of conceptualizing the economy affects the way we see the world. You know, For example, people think that today's free market economics is a direct descendant of uh, Adam Smith. But this is not true. You know, in Adam Smith and other so-called classical economists, the society, the economy was conceptualized as being made up of classes, you know, not individuals. You know? And the whole theory evolved around how the way these different classes with different material interests behave affect the way capital is accumulated, the economy grows, income is distributed, and so on. Today, in free market economics, there is only individual. You know? When you uh, tell people, oh, uh, you know, isn't there a class? They say, no, I mean, that, that's an old Marxist concept. But if that's the case, why do the marketing companies have all these uh, class categories when they do <coughs> marketing campaign strategy? Yeah? Because they uh, look at yeah, groups A, B, C, C1, C2, yeah? target the advertising according to the type of people. Now, many economists will tell you that economics is a science in which there's only one right theory. There are at least nine different major schools of economics, and indeed several more if you count minor schools or split the major ones into sub-schools, each with its own unique strengths and weaknesses. And for free market economics alone, you have three different kinds. Classical economics, neoclassical economics, Austrian economics. So actually there isn't one right theory. And my contention is that we need all these diverse approaches to economics in order to fully understand our economy, because they all make certain assumptions. They all have different underlying political and ethical values. They have all the sorts of different theories about how the economy grows and so on. And to make this point, I give you the Singapore problem, or what I call life is uh, stranger than fiction. Eh? You know, if you read only the financial newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the Economist magazine, you'll be only told that Singapore succeeded because of uh, its uh, free trade policy and its welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors. This is partly true. I mean, they did have those things, but you will never be told that Singapore government owns nearly 90% of all the land. 85% of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises. So in talking about Singapore, I always uh, tell my students, look, give me one economic theory. It doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Marxist, Austrian, Schumpeterian. Give me one economic theory that can explain Singapore. Well, there isn't. So you need to know these uh, different theories to fully understand how a country like uh, Singapore could succeed. So in this regard, my advice is that you should not be a man or a woman with a hammer by learning only one kind of economic theory. Because whatever that uh, theory is, uh, once you believe that one theory is true, like the man with the hammer, you will start to see everything as a name. So I say that you should get a Swiss knife. Yeah? In this dominant economic theory that is uh, of today, that is uh, neoclassical theory, People are mainly conceptualized as consumers. 
And work is uh, considered as what uh, these economists call disutility that you have to put up with so that you can earn money with which you consume goods and services and then derive pleasure or what they call utility. That's your aim, deriving pleasure from consumption. But what happens in our workplace uh, fundamentally affects us, not just our immediate physical and psychological well-being, but also our identity and our sense of self-worth and our self-fulfillment. This is why these days in many rich countries, a lot of people are very unhappy compared to, say, a couple of decades ago, despite the fact that they have higher income. Why? Because uh, the work has uh, become more stressful. But then... You know, economists tell you, no, you should be happy. You know, Britain today has a 20% higher income than, uh, say, 1975. You know? Why aren't you happy? Yeah? <laughs> you know, my book is uh, not just an explanation of economic theories and facts. It's also a discussion about the role of economics in public life. And in this regard, I have three sets of ob- observations to make. The first one is never trust an economist. And that includes me. You know, professional economists that like to say, ah, we know what is correct, you know. No, they don't have a monopoly over truth. I already told you that there are nine different kinds of economic theory. So the right conclusion depends on which economist you talk to. And I argue that it is entirely possible for people who are not professional economists to have sound judgments on economic issues. I even argue that sometimes their judgments may even be better than those of professional economists because they may be more rooted in reality and less narrowly focused. And I argue that indeed the willingness on the part of the ordinary citizens to challenge professional economists and other experts is a foundation of democracy. You know, if you really believe that all we have to do is to listen to the experts, to listen to the professional consensus of the experts, why do you need democracy? Yeah, uh, let self-elected elites that, uh, appoint each other and run the world. You know, this is why a lot of people are unhappy with the European Union. Yeah? The second point is the Latin phrase uh, that is apparently written on the walls of the city hall of uh, Gouda, the city in the Netherlands, uh, which is famous for the cheese. And it says, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to uh, pretend to speak Latin, so it uh, basically says, listen even to the other side. Hmm? And I argue that this is the attitude you have, have to have in debating on economic issues. I'm not suggesting that you should have no opinion of your own. But what I'm trying to tell you is that given the complexity of the world and given the necessarily partial nature of all economic theories, you should be humble about the validity of your own favorite theory and should keep an open mind about it. Finally, even while I constantly make reform proposals, I emphasize how difficult it is to change the economic reality. Well, sometimes uh, the reason is uh, obvious. I mean, people who benefit from the status quo want to thwart uh, change by any means, you know, lobbying, bribery, media propaganda, and even violence. But the status quo often gets defended even without some people actively being evil. Because uh, the thing about the market system is that the rule is one dollar, one vote. You know? So this means that the ability of those with less money to refuse undesirable options given to them is highly constrained. Also, we can be susceptible to beliefs that are against our own interests. You know, the best uh, that, uh, example is that what happened when Barack Obama tried to reform the American medical insurance system, and there were all these pictures of uh, old pensioners demonstrating against uh, what they call Obamacare, with placards that are saying things like, government hands off my Medicare. (laughs) Well, except that Medicare is a government program. (laughs) Well, this is what the Marxists used to call false consciousness, or also known as uh, the Matrix, the movie. (laughs) But acknowledging the difficulties involved in changing the economic status quo should not make us give up the fight to create a better economy and better society. Yes, changes are difficult, but in the long run, if enough people fight for something hard enough, many impossible things can happen. 
And I don't forget, I mean, 200 years ago, if you suggested America should abolish slavery, you would have been branded at least uh, unrealistic, yeah? and that, that probably the loony. Yeah? 100 years ago, the, the, the British government put women in prison for asking for vote. A lot of women actually said, why do we need votes? We have our husbands and brothers to represent our views. Well, this is why I quote Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, uh, who once said that we need to have pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. Yeah, you have to accept the difficulties of changing this status quo, but you have to believe that this can be done. And finally, as uh, Nelson Mandela used to say, it always seems impossible until it is done.